I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai, your host. I am here with Karen Apple and Isaac Miller from the Daily Archetype. And we are on um, chapter um, six, the, the way to the deep interior um, of Dr. Murray Stein's book, um, Young's Map of the Soul. Thank you, Karen. Young's Map of the Soul. Um, so today, without further ado, we're going to get into it, but I will let uh, Isaac introduce himself um, and Karen introduce herself. So Isaac? Um, hello, I'm Isaac J. Miller from The Daily Archetype, and this has been exciting stuff. I want to encourage people to uh, just do more of this and enjoy it because what we're trying to do here is like a study discussion, which I think just can really help to get the most out of these chapters. Uh, I listened to and or read these chapters as we're getting ready for this a, b a bunch of times now. And I've been amazed at how like just even each little time I'll kind of like glean something new from it that maybe I wouldn't have uh, the, the first time. So, um, yeah, it's exciting stuff. And um, what do you think, Karen? <laughs> Well, I'm Karen Apple. I'm in my final year of Nick Capacity Medical School, and I am super excited that we have this study group to dig deep into this chapter because I started writing down different definitions of anima animus, and I'm at six, and I'm so confused. Mm. So hopefully we can clear some stuff up or maybe make it even more confusing. But Or both. Either way, I'm here for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I started this chapter and I, I realized that I started arguing with myself. <laughs> so not arguing with Young or Stein in particular, mm. but arguing with myself about uh, terminology. That's deep. So <laughs> part of it was that I, I, the innate contradiction in Young saying that each of us has all the archetypes mm. and that we don't we only carry the either the masculine or the feminine archetype or mm -hmm. the anima or the animus is what we're going to cover today but then i thought what if they are bipolar what if they exist on the same pole what if they are not separate archetypes well that's the nature of the poles in general by the way is that there there's there this that sort of is the nature of any pole is that it it's united with its opposite, but, but go ahead with your self argument. Yes. Yeah, so that was one of my arguments. The other argument was what if they both existed, but one was more prominent than the mm -hmm. other. One was activated more mm -hmm. than the other. And what if they both existed and they're both activated, then you would be a chameleon. You could move in and out of persona, mm -hmm. whether feminine or masculine. Because what uh, I think Stein starts to talk about is that the anima and the animus are connected to persona and to the outer world. And shadow. And shadow. And ego. Yeah, yeah. complementary to persona. Mm -hmm. yep. So let's start with complementary to persona. Go ahead, Karen. Mm, yeah, go ahead. Well, that was one of my six definitions. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> So, um, I guess meaning it's complementary to the persona, meaning whatever you are showing to the outside world, the anima or animus is, it doesn't mean it's the same. It means it, I don't, I don't know, it supports that personality or that persona. Ooh. Ooh. It complements it. Uh, I think it's the connection between them. The more complementary it is to it, the more connected it is to it. The less complementary it is to it, the less of a connection there is. Connection. Yeah. So uh, sometimes I think of it as we, we kind of have to deal with metaphor uh, because in describing these things, it's almost like, uh, let's say each of us were to go into uh, Lahab's living room, where he, but this is for a metaphor. Uh, a room that we, but it's a room that none of us have ever been in before, and we're com we're totally blindfolded, 
And so then we go in that room and we have to like feel ourselves, feel our ways around and maybe use any senses that we can other than sight and then get back outside of the room and take turns uh, describing what we think was in there in, in this particular room. And the, the reason that that is kind of the analogy that I think of is because these we're describing a we're describing phenomena and you know it's not like dealing with uh, anatomy or you know psychic you know, the, psychic phenomena correct right the because you can't see it uh and in some ways you know we, we try to put it into bi biological things like how neurons act together and how uh you know brain chemistry works and things like that and there's some of that that actually translates well as far as like uh, you know, brain chemistry going into psychic energy and, and those type of things. So anyway, I, I mentioned that because um, the way that we then have to describe these things is in relationship to each other. And so that's why this is called the map of the soul, because just like a road map, uh, what a road is going to be, although it's a road map that we can't see, we can only describe it. So the so it's like the way that a uh, highway is going to behave compared to like an alley or a street or anything else is going to have to do with the deal with the uh, relationships that it connects with. So, uh, you know, like a certain certain uh, things will connect to others d depending on their, their relationships. So I say that to say how that we understand an anima animus is going to be different if it's relating to the ego, if it's relating to the persona, mm. and if it's relating to all the different archetypes, which all the archetypes kind of relate in different ways. And sometimes they go through each other, just like you would traveling through. Uh, yeah, but uh, Stein makes uh, Stein is making some specific mm. type of connections between the persona mm -mm. and the anima and the animus. Right. And that they're um, they're connected right, right, right the more they're connected um the more individuated you are and the less connected they are the more you are run by basically unconscious powers yeah um, and i think i think what the connection versus disconnection has a lot to do with is okay so these archetypes are natural phenomena in everyone like we learned i think a couple of weeks ago Everyone has essentially the same instincts and the same archetypes, but on top of those or between those, we get personal, um, not projections, oh, complexes. And so what makes the, the division that's unhealthy is the personal complexes. And so the more that we overcome those, like we do in therapy or good relationships, like we you know, learned about in this chapter, uh, relationships, moral effort, and through methods like JAMP, the more we overcome those complexes, so then we become a unified whole again, instead of this, uh, you know, people losing their minds. <laughs> so part of the idea of the anima and the animus is yeah. that it is um, like all archetypes and it's in itself. Mm -hmm. It's not personal. It's impersonal. It is not of this world, yet it is that of psychic world. Yeah, it's like a psychic universal. It's a psychic universal. I like that. And the psychic universal would have to contain both. If it's universal, it would have to contain both images. So for the, the sake of argument, and feminine, you mean? Yeah, I think so. Mm. I think that the two poles, I think the archetypes sit on two poles. The last time Jung revisited this was in the 1950s. I think he would see um, he was already having certain definition um, being inserted, but he, I don't think he was quite at ease with how these two things unfolded. Yeah, well, okay, I made a note of that yesterday when I was reading this again. And the, the note that I made is that, and I think it's kind of what you two are touching on, is how that, and, and uh, 
Stein mentioned it once or twice in this chapter, how that um, Freud was often criticized for being a little bit overly emphasizing on uh, on sex. And some people would criticize Carl Jung that he was overly emphasized on anima animas. Not that they necessarily don't exist, but that, you know, he says they're the source of all projections and, you know, th things like that, that he's maybe overly focused. And so that's kind of like what one thing I was taking note of and wondering about. And then I was wondering, is that possibly because of the time that they were in, the, the, you know, the turn of the 19th, 20th century and early 20th century, where especially in uh, Europe, they were uh, a bit overly sexually repressed and people were more into their masculine or feminine, uh, you know, social gender roles. And I would say that's partially true, but it's not necessarily like he's overly emphasized on it, but that it can seem that way because what I think, and this is what uh, Stein was getting into when he was writing this even just in the 90s, is that these are still issues in that, yes, we are, uh, especially even now, we're in 2020, almost 2021, where um, these, we still have the masculine and feminine. Like even though most guys are less masculine and a, a bit more feminine, than they used to, especially compared to 50 or 100 years ago. And same thing for women. But even if you have a person that's uh, bisexual in every way, as far as their roles and everything else, there's still that play of the energies within themselves and how it projects out on the world. So Yeah, which would make perfect sense. It yeah, would yeah. just be like uh, the four archetypes. Yeah, yeah, essentially. You, you, you lean towards one archetype, one archetype, Mm -hmm. possesses you in a way the others don't you can access them but they they're not uh not yours right, right. not not really something that connects to you doesn't drive you is not your primordial image right. <clears throat> as uh young puts it right, right. but i could see so um i mean uh when I speak of image in this book, I do not mean psychic reflection. This is young and psychological types. Mm -hmm. But a concept derived from poetic usage, namely a figure of fancy or mm -hmm. fantasy image, which is related only indirectly to the perception of an external object. It's not. This image depends much more on unconscious fantasy activity. And as the product of such activity, it appears more or less abruptly in consciousness somewhat in the manner of a vision or hallucination, but without possessing the morbid traits that are found in a clinical picture. The image has psychological character of a fantasy idea and never the quasi real character of a hallucination. It never takes the place of reality and can always be distinguished from sensuous reality by the fact that it is an inner image. As a rule, it is not a projection in space, although in exceptional cases it can appear exteriorized form. This mode of manifestation must be termed archaic when it is not primary, primarily pathological, though that would not be by any means <clears throat> do away with its archaic character. On the primitive level, however, the inner image can easily be projected in space as a vision or auditory hallucination without being a pathological phenomenon. Basically, here... And the other line, he also says in line uh, paragraph 747, the primordial image elsewhere, also termed archetype, is always collective. That's from psychological types, by the way. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that uh, there is a differentiation uh, with uh, what is accessed. And I think that the, the archetypes, certain archetypes are more dominant than other archetypes in each individual. Right. Well, it's almost like how we're a little bit overly dominated by the ego archetype slash complex. And then, but then the self is also just as much, but it's on a more unconscious level. And then the same thing with, uh, all the others, or at least the majors or the universal ones, is that they are 
but they but they come in and out. Uh, it's it's mostly a matter of how they go from unconscious to conscious. So same thing with um, well that and how that they interplay with on the inside and with others in relationships. So uh, just like I was saying about you know even if we're all uh, bisexual in our roles and wh whatever else, which to uh, arguably maybe we are, uh, but even if that's the case, in relationships for different things, we're going to in, uh, play off of each other depending on how that those are. So like someone being – because they, they've got to complement each other as opposites. In, that's in what Stein would say. That would be the persona. Stein would say that – the the two the two archetypes the way they play off each other right. or attune to each other is through the persona the more the person is engaged with the inner archetype mm -hmm. anima or animus mm. the more connected it is to the persona the more individuated the human being is the more he says if the person i think and i'm going to take him out of quote but mm -hmm. he says that the more the person's external persona matches who they are internally, the more individuated they are and the more they are in their element of they are connected. If it's a male, mm -hmm. um, it would be with its anima. And if it's the feminine, it would be with its animus. So um, I thought that was interesting. What did you think, Karen? Yes. Um, well, what I am, uh, I think both of you are kind of about to, t or did touch on the inner world. Mm. And of note, uh, Stein says that that anima animus is also, it's their attitude towards the inner world, AKA it's how they treat themselves. Like their, their internal voice dialogue and, and, how they treat themselves, how they talk to themselves, like yeah. where other people can't hear. You know what I mean? Yeah. And then by, by the way, there's like two kinds of inner too. Like there's mm -hmm. the inner that's like you, you can shut off your mouth and just have your like inner thoughts inside your head. That's one type of inner. But then the deeper inner is like the unconscious that you don't even consciously hear sometimes until it kind of like mm -hmm. comes into that conscious uh, psychoid realm, you, you might call it. Um, and so the, that those three are kind of well, and that's inner then the outer is like how it interplays with uh, each other and then ultimately has to go on the inside of, of other people too. So it's like it's almost mm -hmm. like that quaternity of like the levels of inner and outer. Um, and then they're always like it's, it's, an, it's like an energy or a uh, well, they're so so before we get off task, yeah, yeah, yeah. Karen, Karen, go on, go on with uh, where Stein is and where you are. Well, I get it's very um, tricky. So, for example, um, when he discusses being secretly secretly attracted to someone carrying a projection of one's anime, like. I'm thinking like that opposites attract because you're attracted to the projection of your anime. And I'm using that as a so know, that, gender neutral. The anima is, is projected onto the other because um, of how undifferentiated the person is. But he also says okay. that it's an automatic projection. He says it's automatic. The question is, is if you keep like just going with the automatic projection. Mm. In itself, yeah. he says in itself, it's not a big deal. But if you start to follow it, then it becomes an issue. Because now um, it's no longer automatic. You are putting conscious purpose into it. And the more undifferentiated we are, the more we will... Uh, find people to connect to who are undifferentiated. He uh, starts to kind of like cut up certain things and make them like say that somebody who 
is undifferentiated, will find uh, the anima or the animus will take them towards somebody who is undifferentiated or somebody who's archaic also. But he mentioned psychological types in this chapter, and I thought, since we're having um, the conference and um, the theory of one, mm. he starts this out on page 524. And this is related to the anima and the animus because this is all part of one psychic map. So where we pinpointed several things on that psychic map, right? Ego, shadow, persona. We, we have been sketching this, the complexes, the architect. We have been shading in all these different pieces. And now I thought I'd add this from Young, and this is a psychological theory of types. This is a volume six. This was written around 1931. Character is the fixed individual form of the human being. Because if before, uh, when you read this chapter, um, Stein was trying to talk about how uh, the archetypes in themselves don't perform a character, but they put pieces of something that becomes ultimately that character. It's how those pieces are connected that, that basically produce that character, that person. Character is the fixed individual form of a human being. This is um, young. Since this form is compounded of body and mind, a general characterological, characterology must be teach the significance of both physical and psychic features. The enigmatic oneness of the living organism has its corollary, the fact that bodily traits are not merely physical nor mental traits, merely psychic. The continuity of nature knows nothing of those antithetical distinctions which the human intellect is forced to set up as aids to understanding. The distinction between mind and body is an artificial dichotomy, mm. an act of discrimination based far more on the peculiarity of the intellectual cognition than on the nature of things. In fact, so intimate is the intermingling of bodily and psychic traits that not only can we draw far reaching inferences as to the constitution of the psyche from the constitution of the body, but we can also infer from psychic peculiarities the corresponding bodily characteristics. It is true that the latter process is far more difficult, not because the body is less influenced by the psyche than the psyche by the body, but for quite another reason. In taking the psyche as our starting point, we work from the relatively unknown to the known, while in the opposite case, we have the advantage of starting from something known, that is from visible body, despite all the psychology we think we possess today, the psyche is still infinitely more obscure to us than the visible surface of the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally. So um, in the theory of one, mm -hmm. this is, uh, I think, what we start with as our opening statement. Mm -hmm. Because this talks about um, how everything is interconnected in ways that we don't understand. But what we think we understand in psyche, we cannot see. And what we can see in body, we cannot really understand because the body can be seen, but it cannot be understood by being seen. But it can be seen. Although the psyche is still a for, foreign, barely explored country of which we have only indirect knowledge mediated by conscious functions that are open to almost endless possibilities of deception. And remember that the archetypes and the complexes mess with you. And that's what we learn. The number one thing we learn in JAMP is that you have to be 
respectful of the archetypes and the complexes because they will mess with you. And they have their own personality and their own autonomy and their own consciousness. Yes. And they, but they personality, are... not in the way we think personality. Yeah. And they are very uh, defensive for their own uh, survival. That's why they, they'll that, take That's connected to ours. Right, right, right. Um, you know, sometimes when I think of things like what you just read, I'm reminded, I mean, this is a, this illusion of uh, differentiation, or uh, I, don't, I don't know what, what's maybe a, a better word for it, but it's like, the, or that illusion of opposites when everything- Of, of separation. Yeah, that might, that might be the, the, the word, because really everything's the same. Uh, sometimes Alan Watts gives this example of how, you know, he, he has all these lectures you can find on YouTube and everything, where he'll, he'll say, I've got, you're looking at me, a person here in front of you, and you, you think I'm, so I am the foreground of this image in front of you, and there's the background, which could be whatever, a curtain or whatever it happens to be. And you think those are two different things, but they're the same thing because you can't have one without the other. If there was all uh, foreground, you wouldn't be able to tell what's what. And if there was all background, you wouldn't be able to tell what's what. But because they seem to be different, they have this implied unity. Sometimes it's called a, a uh, implicit betweenness. And that goes for just uh, really does go for everything in the universe that everything has this implied unity and implied separation but it's between everything so that's how everything is one which is sort of this um so everything needs each other and they're all connected in different ways and that goes into the one world theory which is kind of what you're talking about and the uh conference that you mentioned that we'll be having next year so uh, he goes on young goes on um, this being so, it seems safer to proceed from outside inwards, mm -hmm. from the known to the unknown, from the body to the psyche. Thus, all attempts at characterology have started from the outside world. Astrology in ancient times even started from interstellar space in order to arrive at those lines of fate whose beginnings lie in the human heart. To the same class of interpre interpretations from the outward signs belong palmistry. Gaul's phrenology, Lavadar's uh, physiognomy, and more recently, graphology, uh, Krautsheimer's physiological types, and Rorschach's uh, cliptographic method. As we can see, there are any number of paths leading from outside inwards from the physical to the psychic. And it is necessary that research should follow this direction until the elementary Psychic facts are established with sufficient certainty. We certainly have moved away from that. We have actually moved away from psyche because psyche is elusive. And this is why we go back to young. We are always, this is why our psychology today is a uh, psychology that's uh, based on um, cognitive behavioral theory which is based inherently in body and uh, not very well attached to body. It's attached to behavior. But he goes on to say, we can then put the question, what are the bodily correlatives of a given psychic condition? Unfortunately, we are not yet far enough advanced to give even an approximate answer. The first requirement is to establish the primary facts of psychic life. This is far from having been accomplished. Indeed, we have only just begun the work of complying an inventory of the psyche, not always with great success. So he's saying that he is stumbling over these pieces that seem to appear and then disappear. But they leave this echo, like the anima and the animas. It leaves an echo. It leaves an echo in the outside and leaves an echo on the inside as radio waves. What do you think, Karen? I, I'm just not really that familiar <laughs> with that text, but um, 
I do, I definitely think that discussions like our one world theory where there's no, where we're not differentiating necessarily between or separating the body and mind is, that is just like awesome. Cause it's just kind of a, we see like what um, Isaac was saying, the foreground and the background, we see those because we need to have something to differentiate, but they're not necessarily a separation. Isaac? Um, well, I don't know. I just think of, and, you know, I encourage to anybody who's getting into this study mm -hmm. or, or even just like ourselves, like uh, even after years or, or decades, we can still get more out of it. The I, I made a post the other day about how what's really interesting and um, great, amazing about psychology and studying the mind is that to really get into it compared to, you know, studying, uh, you know, biology and anatomy and those type of physical things, you don't have to get out a scalpel or a microscope necessarily. And that, that might be helpful in some ways, but you can do it on yourself with, I mean, you might say with a metaphorical blade or microscope, but you can always turn inward and on each other and on relationships and dissect and pull these apart and learn new things. And the, and what's going on it, and the thing to really take note of is how that things go in and out of uh, consciousness or how they go into unconsciousness and then come back up and then how that there's that transformation. And to the point of um, this chapter, the reason that's important is because it's called the anima animus, um, paraphrasing, but the, the way to the inner interiors, which some people debate on that. Some people say the anima and animus come before the shadow. It's, it's a little bit uh, tricky because in some ways there's shadow material on one side of the anima, uh, the anima and animus. In some ways it's, it's after. So some, some people say it's, it's either way as far as shadow before anima and animus or the other way around. Uh, so I think... Uh, Stein is sort of this uh, orthodox of uh, Jungian thought where he says it goes shadow and then anima and animus. And then once you're sort of able to uh, understand that unconscious relationship and, and that projection or manifestation, uh, then you've differentiated enough or integrated enough that you can get into the self area or, you know, the, that, that deepest realm of the unconscious and the universal and the, the collective so it's exciting stuff because it once you get through this it's you get into that deep waters that that ocean like uh place to explore but this is a this is a big one and you know like again like we said there's always more to learn from it because it's not like other things where it's just a thing of itself. It, it has to do with how it, uh, it relates to everything else. Which is well, so that's why we're talking about what we're talking yeah. about is a map. Right, right, right. That has a structure. Right, right. That our pieces are connected. Right. That show us, that show us a bigger picture. Mm. Right? So that's what we're looking at. Um, Young says, well, this book is fascinating, by the way, mm. if anybody wants to, it's a little expensive, but <clears throat> for those who can afford it and like to read, this is a really good book. Mm. A deeper study of the complexes leads logically to the problem of their origin, he says. As to this, a number of different theories are current. Theories apart, experience shows that complexes always contain something like a conflict or at least are either the cause or the effect of a conflict. At any rate, the characteristics of the conflict, shock, upheaval, mental agony, inner strife, are peculiar to the complex. They are the sore spots, the beti naru, the skeletons in the cupboard. I know I said that wrong which we did not like to remember and still less to be reminded of by others, but which we frequently come back to mind unbidden 
and in the most unwelcome fashion. They always contain memories, wishes, fears, duties, needs, or insights which somehow we can never really grapple with. And for this reason, they constantly interfere with our conscious life in a disturbing, usually a harmful way. So when we talk about Jungian advanced motor processing, this is why we have to deal with the complex. They always contain memories, wishes, fears, duties, needs, or insights. So that's how they hook us through memories, through fears, through duties, through needs. And then for the reason they constantly interfere with our conscious existence, our life, in a disturbing and usually a harmful way, especially when they're connected to trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's the treatment that the young and advanced motor processing does is it clears these fears, duties, needs, and insights and wishes out of the complex or lessens the energy that with which they are activated or reactive. Karen, what other part of the book did you find uh, yeah, part you of the chapter? You had like six different definitions and we only got yeah. into like two or three of them. Yeah, totally. Um, what do you all think about the uh, phrase guide of fate? Like the anima animus is a guide of fate. I thought that was, that was at the near the end, I think. Because your fate is somehow connected to uh, the character of which you end up connecting to? Well, what... It, part of it is so this is going to be different for everybody is how how much that the masculine and feminine will uh manifest in the persona and ego consciousness and the unconscious and then whatever that might be its opposites are always in that world and projecting into the out wor outside world um on different levels consciously unconsciously now well, let, let me – okay, I'll give a, a sort of personal example of um, of how this fates itself. And for this chapter, you would probably say especially in uh, close relationships, parental relationships, and romantic relationships. But sort of a personal example that I thought of because I actually recently had a dream, and it was interesting. That there wasn't a, a, lot of, a lot of detail to it, but towards the end – when I just kind of realized, like, oh, it's my my anima projection. It was because at the beginning of the dream, it was just like a casual hanging out with my uh, ex-girlfriend. But then toward the end of the dream, my ex-girlfriend became my ex-wife, like literally the, the transformed into a different person. And, that, and so then that's when I'm like, oh, it's the, I'm just like interacting with my uh, anima projection. And as that I thought of that which seemed pretty inconsequential but one, one thing that i um looked back on the last couple of years is i'd kind of like what, what what is it making you conscious of isaac right so what it's making co me conscious of is how that those two relationships played out very differently because my ex-wife for example had a ver a personality very very uh similar to my own and in, in just about every way like how uh, masculine versus feminine we were how like we're, we're both uh intps things like that um but my ex-girlfriend was very opposite of my personality and so the the one with my ex-wife it became it didn't work out because we were or one reason didn't work out is because our we weren't opposite enough and then on the other hand with my ex-girlfriend it was almost too successful in a lot of ways and too like passionate like shoot to the moon and explode because we were so perfectly opposite of each other uh, and so that's how and like in, this was years ago before i got into knew anything about anima anonymous and unconscious things like that so at the time i'm just like oh i'm just ha having relationships or whatever what, what is your psyche saying though your psyche is saying it's the same it's the same but the, to uh karen's point 
the the way that things fade out in different or come into our lives and our fate is plays out in different ways is um just like you might and that's that's in romantic relationships or whatever but it's the same thing why that certain friendships will go better or not and why that you know business partnerships or whatever will go certain ways or not in some of it might have a sexual energy or not but if you are it depends on how complementary opposites you are versus how complementary alike you are and then how that that plays together and so so, so there's going to be some situations where you want to be complementarily the same as certain people and then there's going to be others where it's better to be complementary opposite um and so that's how that we're kind of like fated to go in different direction depending on uh all these you know manifestations into these levels of consciousness both of uh the masculine feminine and all other types of character but your psyche is informing you that what you think is different or opposite or complementary is yeah. the same well, it's the same. And then also what was interesting about what my psyche was in informing me there is that as much as we often think we are relating to another person, we are, but we're also relating to ourselves. And then beyond even that, which is like the real transcendent level is like even like we're doing now or you do or anyone does in like a close relationship is the people involved in it if they are really connecting on any kind of like a deep unconscious level it's that they start to connect on the level of the self and the collective unconscious and that's where there's like that transcendent li limit and he gets more into that toward the end of this chapter and the next chapter especially where it gets into more of like a, a transcendent realm uh, because you start to connect on not just like projections and roles and things like that but you project on you connect on this experiential level of the unconscious self and uh you you make that deeper connection that's always trying to get through of, of the self that's that's why that like if you have like a really deep meaningful relationship even if it's a, a friend or a family member or of course romantic relationships um even there's you're just friends whatever if sometimes it can feel like a spiritual connection you know and it's, and it's just that you have a connection on that unconscious self level so that's what's going on <laughs> i don't know if that yeah. if that that might kind of help to what uh karen was bringing up a minute ago i like the anima mm. in, in the dream mm -hmm. but usually it metamorphosis from one thing to another mm. is because it's telling you you're missing a connection mm. that usually when it's telling you something it's telling you something is very similar here something is the same mm. And that, and usually the psyche, when it when it takes something symbolic mm -hmm. and plays with it, your psyche, mm -hmm. images of former lovers, or mm -hmm. it's not literal, mm -hmm. but the anima is basically saying you are not seeing me. Well, yeah, and I, and I think you're you're right, and what it's trying to get at there is that it's saying like see me, which is my own inter interior although when i say my own really mm. i mean like the universal self inter interior which is kind of the point of this you know chapter like we mentioned the way to the inner interior so if you can uh connect with that in inner which is is usually outer which is why that you know in this book he talks about you need to uh uh project it onto other people but th that projection even if, if that's a projection, like right now you have a girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever, and you project on them, it seems like, oh, we're just having a conscious relationship with each other. No big deal. Yes and no, R that's happening. But also at the same time, it's that that projection onto another person. It's 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 like what you do when you reflect on the inside, except you're just not conscious of it. And then, you know, usually what happens in a relationship, um, especially, you know, a long term relationship, like let's say people uh get, get together become boyfriend girlfriend get married at some point about a year maybe two or three years into the relationship that illusion or fantasy of they are my ideal opposite or they are my ideal um masculine or feminine projection falls off and at some point they just start to see okay this is just a person and they see them for what they are and that sort of like mask falls off that they had 
projected onto them for so long. And that's why that then at that time, about a year, two, three years in the relationship, they start like having these uh, troubles. But uh, the way that we that that's really where people can become more like sort of, I don't know, evolved in, or enlightened as a couple is then because then they've gotten past that projection point and then they're just self and psyche. But uh, that's very uncomfortable for most people. So well, that's what Stein says, right? Science mm -hmm. says yeah. we all project. Right. But then when we act on those projections, we have to take responsibility for them. Mm -hmm. Because if we act on the projection, it's like, oh, you know, she's the love of my life and we marry her. You can't just leave her. Right. Yesterday, she was the love of your life. Right. You know, now you need to understand why and how love of your life became the way it has become. And I, I think there's a um, um, Stein talks about. He says, he says uh, uh, go on. Karen. Oh, he says the ability to differentiate between projection and projection carrier between fantasy and reality is rare indeed. And so there's special people that can do that, those rare people. But for the rest of us, the anima animus is Maya, the creator of illusions, the mystifier, the trickster, the ever receiving mirage of the internal beloved. Yeah, so it's always telling us what we want to hear. <laughs> It's always given us the fantasy of the fantasy we want to run after. So we will project the illusion outside into the world, and then we have to run after it. And that's where you get like uh, date movies, like 40 Days and 40 Nights, or you get all these different things of, uh, uh, what is it, uh, with Demi Moore and Robert Redford, was it some kind of, where he offers a million dollars to sleep with her that night. Oh, indecent that's what proposal. we're talking about. Yeah, indecent proposal. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about the anima being projected out. Yeah, and those are good examples. Uh, but that's like constantly in play, no matter who you are. Um, we're just trying to give some uh, to our listeners some yeah. ideas of what they look like. Right. So it's like when you when you look at it in a relationship, whether it's someone's actual boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife, whatever or like in, in a literary sense, whether that's a movie or a book, that's a good example of uh, that inspection of how that looks, but it's constantly going on between mm. every single person, just in different ways. Well, yeah, so in adolescence is going on between right. where the wind is blowing. And when we're first where, born, where, it's like, put where, a boob in my mouth. You're looking. Are you looking to the left or are you looking to the right? Who's coming out of the door to the left and who's coming out of the door to the right? <clears throat> but there's also the projection of the anima. And when you project it out and you start to follow it, when it takes over, well, so um, the movie where Fatal Attraction mm -hmm. is the opposite. It's where she is possessed by the animus. She is possessed by the masculine spirit to have this person, to have this life, to, to be with this person. So that's another form of possession. But what we're trying to do is trying to give examples of the way the anima and the animus operate in the world and the way the, the extremes, because the extremes always bring us back to the slightly funny kind of incidents. It says here on page 143, for purposes of psychological development and increase of consciousness, however, the essential ego action is to engage in the anima and animus in a dialectic process not to follow the call immediately to action this process of dialogue and confrontation called by young and this massive german word ausender <laughs> uh, stong this is a german word that means literally taking something to pieces and refers to the process 
that takes place when two people strongly engage one another in dialogue or negotiation. Neither one fleeing the conflict as they stand head to head and have it out physically or verbally. The difference between them, they were at first gross and barely articulate, become more differentiated. Lines are drawn, distinctions are made, clarity, eventuality achieved. What began as a high emotional confrontation turns into a conscious relationship between two very different personalities. Perhaps an agreement is reached, a contract drawn up and signed. So the more these characters get into it, the more it's a drag on knock down fight, the more you're able to withstand that kind of emotional intensity, the deeper you will get to the source of the connection. Thus, the deeper you will get into the source of the conflict. Uh, let me read a, well, a part of a paragraph. <clears throat> the outcome of an actual encounter with someone who is the carrier, uh, carrier of the anima or animus projection frequency, frequently gives rise in dreams to the sim symbolic psychic image a symbol that goes back to primordial images of the hero's birth. The child that is born signifies individuality with through present, uh, which through present is not yet conscious. So <clears throat> when we connect with someone or we connect on this deeper level with the carrier of our unconscious projection and some of this can even go into uh, it, it goes into like our ideal father figures our ideal mother figures that we project onto others but specifically in this uh our projection of like the ideal opposite gender or the ideal uh, partner or ideal mate when that happens and and he this this is stein referring back to again uh psychological types collected works volume six where it's a primordial image that often come in, comes in through dreams. And I've had dreams like this too over the years where it's like I dream of like being part of, a, you know, childbirth and or like uh, children being born. And there is um, like angelic choir type things. And what that is, is it signifies a, a rebirth of consciousness that happens um, when we connect on these these deeper levels to bring things out from the unconsciousness and to and it's, it's part of the individuation process or the maturation process uh, so it's and again it's it's a tricky thing going on because a lot of it has to always be unconscious and that so it's like it's like we're dealing with our own split personality and other people's split personality. That's just the way that it We're is. We're dealing with several split personalities right. that are projected out through right, a connection. Right. right. So the persona is also a split personality. The persona, mm. is, pre the persona is connected mm. to the anima. And the shadow yeah. and the ego. <laughs> yes, but in different ways. Right, right, right. So the anima is the, connected to the ego, but in different mm. ways, directly connected to... And the self. <laughs> yes, but it's directly connected to the persona. Right. The persona is its its view to the outside. It right. messes with it, right? right? And so, but the ego is it's the view from um, it messes with the inside view. Mm -hmm. So it messes with it from the interior. Right. The um, the anima also and the animus mess with it from the interior, but to project itself out into the exterior. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get lost because uh, Jung's idea of the unconscious is that everything that sprouts up in the unconscious then tries to uh, go somewhere. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't sit in space. Space is moving, which we actually figured out that is space is moving. And we are actually moving away from each other all the time. So um, this is happening. So it's also happening psychically. 
although we're also always everywhere at the same time and we can constantly connect with anyone or anything instantly Correct. but that's some deeper but we're also moving apart as we are moving together certain yeah. parts are moving together certain parts are moving apart and sometimes that reverses yes. <laughs> yeah yeah for sure yeah, yeah if somebody else returns the projection right, right, right. then it reverses then you get caught in a dual projection one person says oh you're my soulmate the other person yeah. says oh you're my soulmate oh my god how did you know I was going to say that? The other person goes, how did you know I was going to say that? Yeah. Oh, my God, we say the same thing. And so there are like a, there's a lot of jokes about that happening. Yeah, but yeah. that is what we're talking about. That's called when you end up projecting on someone and the other person starts projecting on you in the same way. Right, right. And it's it's what's really tricky, too, is, OK, then when that happens in you know these examples of like, um a romantic courtship for example that we just talked about a bit in these chapters is so if somebody starts projecting onto someone you're my ideal lover or whatever now i love I'm, everything about you i love yeah. your lips i love your eyes i love yeah, your hair. The, i love the way you smell i love the way you fart in the morning yeah exactly now on a rationalistic maybe utilitarian type way you could say no 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 uh, I appreciate that, but I'm just this regular person and look, my farts smell bad and whatever else. Uh, but usually what people do is they're like, Ooh, this person is projecting on me. their ideal lover. I'm going to go with that. And sometimes you, you, we do so consciously or unconsciously or, or a combination of that. And so it's, it's a bit of a deception. And sometimes that's, uh, kind of a good thing to go along with. And sometimes it's not, at least at some point when those deceptions start to fall apart. The persona is complemented in this right. case. Right, right, right. So not only is the persona, the, 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 the person's persona, so my persona is complementing the other's persona. Mm. Right? So mm. I've hooked them right. through this long line, right? Because my anima wants to use the persona to hook up outside. So it sends the hook outside, then it hooks them in and then starts to talk to them and say, come here. That's what's, that's what's creative about it. That's what's caring about it. That's why you project onto people, uh, you project love towards a lot of things. Well, you also think of the anima anonymous as passion, as eros, right? Right. Even though Jung didn't want to phrase it that way because he wanted to separate himself from Freud, but mm. that is that is energy. That's libidinal energy that he's talking about. Yeah. He's talking about what is projected outside into the world as libidinal energy. He doesn't want to call it libidinal energy because he disagrees with Freud. Can you guys see this? Yeah. Okay. Um, can you rotate I'll, it? No. Well, I I, <laughs> I I can, but I'm I have it this way for a reason, it, because the the uh, you read sideways. The, well, the sideways parts are kind of beside the point for a moment, okay. Go because ahead. what I'm doing, and I just kind of put this together last night on my phone, so it's not a perfect thing. And some people argue about the the way that the other parts are laid out. So this represents two different people. Um, oh, okay. And I, and I if for those who are audio, I will leave uh, links and things to where they can find this. And otherwise, it's on the video. Well, tell them where what is connecting to what. Right, right. So what's happening here is uh, this is just this random. And the, the reason that I went with this one in particular is just because it worked with what I was trying to do. There's other versions of this sort of image of a map of the soul and the, and the layers to it. Um, and it's, it's one that kind of works, but it's arguable how that these layers of the soul line up. So anyway, um, the reason that I put them this way is to show, uh, how persona connects with each other. And then, which is what we've been talking about for a few minutes here. Um, uh, and then, and what's also going on it on an unconscious level is they are connecting on. A deeper unconscious level depending on on their relationship and, and everything and also by the way you could chain together 
these bubbles infinitely and like like you almost like let's let's say let's that we talk about the top, uh, topography right uh mm. isaac because we're describing this on radio on by voice so yeah. at the bottom you have here at the top of the it's called projections of complexes slash mm. archetypes collective experience world and roles mm. at the bottom you have the archetypes you have the god self image mm. um a self or the god image that uh, Jan calls it but then um, you have uh, a circle, then you have the anima and animas, you have another circle, you have the biological unconscious, and then you have another circle, the cultural unconscious, right. and then you have on the line shadow and then personal unconscious, and then above it you have ego, mm -hmm. and then with the ego you have it going in four different directions, mm -hmm. left, right, up, down, right. and then you have that and then you have a layer called persona. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that is connected to a reverse image of itself on right. the other side. In the middle of that is the physical world, society, objects, people, etc. Those right. are the spaces in between us. Right. But if you if we if we really kind of look at this is the top this is the map of the way it looks. Mm. But I would describe these um, circular or these like mandalas, basically mm. these circular objects that are signifying uh, psyche right. into um, more like wormholes yeah, where sorry. they they fluctuate from the bottom up and the top yeah. down. Yeah, which is kind of the the self going out and about now. But OK, this is the, the but the reason I did it this way is because in this map of the soul book that we're talking about and other, you know, takes on these things, what's strange almost is that it just does it on like an individual level. But none of us just live as individuals. We live as individuals and collective connected. So the reason that I made my own little modification of this to uh, talk about for a minute. I wasn't sure if we'd get into it, but we are real quick at least. Is that the way that per personas and personalities and unconsciouses connect? Is we connect through projections. And the thing, the tricky thing is, sometimes we will project out a false uh, complex, which would be like a fantasy or an, or a false ideal. And this is for an example of why that like so, like we talked about this. Uh, Lob and I on our first podcast we did two or three months ago whatever where um this is why sometimes bad movies are do bad even though you think that they should because they they're costed a billion dollars and everything else is because they're not projecting out the uh, universal archetypes in any type of creative way they're just projecting out some kind of uh, propaganda of complexes that they wanted to put out there and, and they don't do the archetypes right but now when people connect on a deep unconscious level is when that they connect on the level of the universal archetypes. So that's why I put it to, together this way, which is that we uh, connect on the level of projections, complexes, and ideally the uh, archetypes. And that is through collective experience world. And then also the roles that we play. So that's that. Um, I don't know if you have anything else to say on that or maybe what uh no no that's uh, that that's excellent i mean i um i think we should talk about it more as we get into uh young's map of the soul more yeah that goes um, a lot into this chapter but also more into the next chapter which we're kind of transitioning into for next week well before we transition the psyche's transcendent yeah, yeah. center and wholeness mm. the last part um, which Stein basically uh, leaves open sexuality and relationships. Right, right. Um, there's some statements made, so I'm going to just quote Stein. I'm not going to get into it too much, but I'm going to quote Stein on this. So he says, the anima has a predilection for everything that is unconscious, dark, equivocal, and unrelated. Visa at loose ends. Mm-hmm in women and also for her vanity, frigidity, helplessness, 
and so forth. This is what is contained in the unconscious of the male. Right. And it says, why do, you, why do such difficult women attract men so frequently with such ease? It says, why is it that strong women often do not attract men? Young suggests that this predilection for weak and helpless women is based on an animal projection. Right. The animal being undifferentiated and inferior in the unconscious of a strongly male identified person. So somebody who's very machismo and very identified with their power right. or their, their masculine energy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> So he says, age old wisdom tells women that to attract a man, be helpless. Mm -hmm. The enema represents the undeveloped side of a man where he's unconsciously helpless and at loose ends, dark and equivocal. He's attracted by that. Similarly, strong women will be attracted often to weak men, sometimes faithfully, and then become filled with fantasies of saving them from alcoholism or some other decrepitude. Again, they are seeking a lost part of themselves, the animus, who appears as an inferior male projection. Or if she is weak and helpless woman, her unconscious may compensate with images of male competency. She will find herself hopelessly attracted to a, an heroic animus projection carrier. And this is that. Um, so I. That's the complicated part. I think that part of that one of the complicated parts it has a lot of truth in it. I think yeah. a lot of it has a lot of um, it sends you down another highway. And I think what we need mm -hmm. to remember about the anima and the animus is that their connections into the outside world, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Think of it as energy. Mm -hmm. don't think of them as feminine and masculine. These are energies that are created. These are energies that we are attracted to. Mm -hmm. And these are energies that are attracted to us. And for instance, a lot of people you say, um, did you, did you have fun on your date? You know, the energy was really good energy. Mm -hmm. This is the connection or chemistry even. Well, they call it chemistry, yeah. yeah chemistry, yeah. energy, yeah. Kind of means the same thing in that case, but yeah. Karen, what are your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are to wrap this up, or mm. is that what you're talking about? <laughs> well, we're coming to that point, but yeah, whatever. Um, I I think that it's interesting when someone gets caught up in the archetypal energy of the anima. And Stein says, it is evident how these inner structures can distort reality and cause misperceptions between otherwise fairly rational and well-being individuals. And then later he says, it's amazing how distorted some people's views really are. And it is equally remarkable that all of us believe in our own views, absolutely, even when we find serious flaws in them. It is rare that we question a set of basic assumptions. So I think being aware and building consciousness of your anima and your projections um i think the process and you work your way to starting to become more aware you might get burned a lot at first but hopefully you grow and you can catch it and you can learn from this this projection this opposite projection that you are being drawn to like you're not i feel like fate is saying you can be drawn to this person that with this projection but i think you can also that doesn't mean your demise necessarily. You can learn a lot. I, I think that's a really good point, Karen. Um, for those who are having multiple bad relationships, it's time to start talking to the inner feminine instead of the projected feminine or what is outside. Remember the conversations you've had with all these pr people that you've, um, remember what they've said to you, remember what you said to them. Remember where the energies led you because that will make you more conscious of what is happening in your unconscious in terms of how it's being projected out and how you're getting caught up with all these different characters or the same character over and over again in many different disguises. Um, because what 
the attraction is always um, inside outside. It's not outside inside. It's mm. inside outside because the anima is the energy or the animus is the energy that is projected onto the outside. But it's inside outside. The energy is moved from the inside, from the interior. Our unconscious is differentiated. The more differentiated we understand our unconscious to be or the differentiation in our unconscious, the better we're off. The less differentiated we understand our differentiation of our unconscious is less differentiated. Something that is still looks at it as murky water that cannot be crossed, then uh, we have a problem because we need to bring these things to the light, to consciousness. We need to bring these things, these undifferentiated unconscious material into the light so we could take a look at it and hopefully remember what it is that we're taking a look at because it will disappear again into the unconscious. <laughs> and that's the trick. And uh, thank you so much for joining us for our last podcast of uh, 2020. Um, the Institute for Conflict uh, would like to um, bid all of you a great and wonderful coming year. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, a vaccine or several vaccines to help everybody out and to get over uh, corona and conflict. I think we've ran corona and conflict into the ground as a subject matter. And hopefully when we start up um, in uh, the coming year, we will have a new title, maybe corona and in time of corona and vaccine, but we will figure it out as we come closer to the new year. I wish all of you a very happy new year and I wish all of you a safe and wonderful holiday. I am Dr. Lahab Al Samurai. This is the Institute for Conflicts Individuation podcast. And I would like to bid you uh, farewell. I will let my, um, my friends, my co-hosts here, uh, Karen and Isaac, um, bid you farewell. All um, right. Go ahead. So, I'm Karen Apple. It's been a joy to be a guest on this podcast, and I really appreciate it. I hope I'm invited back next year, and I didn't overstay my welcome. I do want to say that informed consent is super important, so definitely read your vaccine insert so you understand what it's doing and what um, possible side effects there are and whether you should get it or not. Discuss with your medical provider. Very good. Um, I'm Isaac J. Miller, and this has been a pleasure Another rabbit hole I'm just going to touch on, but it's it's very deep, so I, I will barely touch on it. Is on this on my on my subject is that of Star Wars, <laughs> and that Star Wars right now is trying to fix what that they did in the latest uh, trilogy because they went too far in their uh, some of what they did in their anima animus things that happened, and specifically that is. The denigration of men, specifically Luke Skywalker. <laughs> and that's a whole other can of worms that we might get into another series. And I, in fact, I'm sure we will at some point in 2021. But uh, it's interesting how these things play out in art and literature and uh, cinematic events like this. And 2021, I am excited for it and excited to keep doing this and hope to see more of these people and other people. So stay archetypal, everyone. Okay, people, thank you. That was um, fascinating as always. <laughs> uh, next week.